Welcome to CD Oasis. I'm Shura Gesayer. And today I welcome once again Dr. Paul Belziki for another clinical case with interesting findings and an interesting treatment. Dr. Belziki, how are you? How are you doing with COVID? <clears throat> Physically good. Mentally, it's a soul sucking uh, time. Yeah, very it is. Very it is difficult. Different. At the end of the day, it's difficult. Yeah, it is taking a toll on, on everyone, yeah. especially on you guys. So um, as usual, before we go and see the case, uh, mm -hmm. can you tell us what it is about and what are some of the takeaways that uh, your colleagues might keep with them? The case is, uh, is an extensive case where I had to design a smile for somebody, an older woman that my age, older, uh, that just wanted to have a nice smile after uh, a lifetime. And it's how I carried that out, as I'm fond of saying, using old school techniques. Takeaways, there's no simple takeaway in dentistry. There, there just isn't. Everything requires time, effort, dedication to detail, and making sure that you don't miss anything. And ironically, in this case, I did. Fortunately, I caught it. And this will all be explained in the course of the presentation. Perfect. So no, nothing easy, hard work. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. For those of you that are viewing this for the first time, let me tell you that I'm a general practitioner. I provide periodontal surgery, endodontics, and restorative dentistry, from simple to complex. And I endeavor to integrate all of these protocols to deliver long lasting restorations in terms of decades. And that's proven to be the case. So after 40 years, I've restored just about everything. And hence, I'm able to draw upon a vast body of experience to solve unique problems that present to this office. I rely solely on evidence-based protocols. And sometimes I think that even needs defining whose evidence well, usually materials from university faculties and their members from textbooks and peer reviewed materials. That's what I rely on. I'm not a guru. There's no Belziki technique. I'm a firm believer that success is a planned event where every step must be anticipated and executed with exactness. You have to keep on top of everything so nothing gets by you. There are no shortcuts to success. It's a hard job. And I'm doing it old school. So let's dive into this case. This is a person about my age, retiring, wants a nice smile. She's been with me for about four or five years. During that time, she came in and said, I really am not fond of my smile. I said, well, let's fix up the posterior segments. Once we get that stable and we've developed a stable occlusion, then we can, we can work on the uh, smile. And that's how treatment progressed. So she came in and it was time to do this and time to tackle it. And again, doing it old school. So you have to start with careful analysis of what's about to happen on all your patients. So exact record keeping, thorough record keeping, if you will, is very important. So I. Oh, for me, that includes lots of photographs, and I take these, number them, and they get included in letters to the patient, numbering them so they can follow, follow along. And she was having the case starting on this crowded cuspid from the mesial and the distal that was starting to be a concern. Asymptomatic, but it was starting to work through the tooth. There you can see that I've magnified it a bit. Here are the radiographs. There's the decay that's present for her age. I, she's had some moderate bone loss, but it's, it's stable. Tissue doesn't bleed. Really not a lot of periodontal pocketing, except in those areas where the tissue's bunched up due to crowding. But the teeth are firm, and there were no perio or endo issues. We had talked about restoring the second quadrant, perhaps with some implants and sinus lifting and all the rest of it, and she just did not want to go for it. I don't want 
implants and I don't want orthodontics. I want this done seamlessly and I don't want to wear braces at the age that she's at. So I said, fine, but at least I have to present those options, which I did. And I still rely on stone models, study models, because I can work out problems. I can work on the patient without the patient being there essentially. So I'm still in the realm of stone models. We, we pour these up at the office and I'm able to assess the case and the problems that are there. So here uh, you can see that the cuspids are blocked out to the buckle there. And I thought, if I could bring that in, and this surface, if I can bring those surfaces in and take this lateral and somehow move that out, I'll make a, unif a more uniform alignment of the anterior segment and then play with the, uh, with the dimensions of the teeth afterwards. So I just Photoshop what my vision is of what I intend to do and start carrying that out on the stone models. So stone models provides me a medium to find out what is possible. So here I've just shaved the buccal surface off and I've done the same thing on the left cuspid. I've just smoothed that off and then went ahead and built out that lateral and just added some more blue block out material. This is just done very quickly just to find out what, what is possible, what I think I can do. Same thing on the right side. So I've taken these prominent surfaces and I just smooth them down and added blue block out material. And this is my vision. This is what I think I can pull off in the mouth. And then I drew a sheet of plastic over it, acetate, vacuum form. And that will help in making my provisionals. The plan was to address the right side first. There was the need to remove that cuspid and then make a fixed provisional bridge so the person would never be without teeth. She could come in with teeth, leave with teeth, and just carry on as if nothing had happened. So now patient is in, and now I have to carry out that plan, that vision on the patient. So the first thing I did was just knock off the coronal part of the cuspid and prepare the teeth on either side. I did this in this fashion. I didn't want to extract that tooth first because then with the air rotor, there's blood going all over the place. I did this uh, in 2018, pre-COVID, but still. I also, in trimming amalgam, I didn't want to force it into a socket. So I did my the majority of my tooth preparation before I removed that tooth. Then I did remove the tooth. I had noted decay in this area. And at that point, I could just remove it, flow in a little bit of key tack cement and trim that down and then prepared the central. So I'm going to make a fixed provisional splint immediate using the central lateral and the first bicuspid and then try to trim in a pontic cuspid that, looked, that would look reasonable. So that's the sheet that I had ready, a little bit of foil over the socket, flood that with methyl methacrylate, powdered liquid resin material, and then it's on to the 3D printer. And the, the 3D printer I've used for most of my life is this variety. I've I've got 10 digits. There are no revisions to these things. They just, they've worked most of my life without any problem. And yes, as I've said often, dentistry is a craft of the hand. So taking this block of acrylic, using nothing more than an electric hand piece, straight hand piece with a sandpaper disc, I start knocking off all of the excess and trimming away what's not required and making a provisional bridge. Making sure that I have good embrasure spaces for cleaning. And then that's inserted, cemented in, and the patient can leave. Now, this is the importance of 
provisionals that will replicate what the final design is because now a patient can go home and test drive it for form and function. Relatives, friends, people can take a look at it. You know, is it too big, too small, too, too bulky, not bulky enough? It's always too something. I want to hear all of those and work that out in this phase because methyl methacrylate powder liquid acrylic allows me to add and subtract at will. I don't have to keep remaking provisionals for, for any reason. So she walked in like this, she walked out like that, happy as can be. And that socket has to go on to heal. She returned after a few months and we're starting to get some soft tissue closure. She reports back, she's happy with the form, she's happy with the function. So I capture that in another stone model and now I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing on the left side. I've trimmed off some of the facial surface, added some blue blockout material, drawn acetate sheet over it, and tooth preparation, again, resin material, off to the 3D printer, start trimming it down. And this, this is the usefulness of, of good study models. And then I employ the computer between my ears. I just take a set of calipers. I measure what I had done for the right central and then transfer that over to the left central because I did bring this out a little bit. Now I have to at least make some uniformity uh, or the symmetry between right and left side. A little pencil line is scratched. And then after some trial and error of adding and subtracting and trimming, I finally stand back and I think, okay, I've played with it until my eyes are happy. I don't measure things. I don't look at ratios. It's just after all of these years, I've got to know what a uniform, decent smile looks like. And to my eye, this was aesthetically pleasing. And I had just made one little pontic here, a standalone um, cantilevered pontic, she had no teeth here, was not interested in an implant case, didn't want teeth on the bottom. She'd been like this long before she came to me. She can eat and function, so I didn't have to worry about restoring that segment. So this is the art part of dentistry, is what do you have conceptualizing? Where do you want to go? So it's analysis and vision. The science part of dentistry is making durable, pleasing, harmonious restorations for a patient. And the provisional phase is not some slapdash event that occurs at the end of a long appointment. You're making, you're making your vision into a reality and then allowing the patient to test drive that reality with the provisionals. Aesthetic cosmetic dentistry, I really don't like that term as far as I'm concerned. It's just good and bad dentistry. But even what's concealed, even the prepared teeth have to be beautiful in terms of what form is correct, what protocols are correct. And you want teeth that are not overprepared. You've taken away just enough to make allowances for the restorative materials. You want gently converging axial walls for good retention and resistance form. So even what's hidden, there's an aesthetic to that as well. What is correct? So after several months, she has come back. The socket has gone on to heal. Uh, this material does pick up coffee, tea stains and the like after five, six months. That's to be expected. But the patient was warned and understood that. And now it's time to get impressions to finalize this case. So after an extraction, there's usually areas that need to be addressed once again. So you have to refine the provisionals. Sorry, you have to refine the, uh, the prep teeth. And I did that. And my first impression, what I thought is if I can capture as many landmarks as I can to give the lab an idea of where the midline is, 
and the anatomy of the teeth, I thought it would be a good idea to take an impression with the provisionals in place on the left side and the prepared teeth on the right side. And one does have to be honest with oneself. There was a series of posts uh, a week or two ago uh, by myself and another gentleman by the name of Nate Lawson expounding on, you have to give a lab a perfect impression that is defect free. So that's what I endeavor to do. As I said, I've prepared that margin down. I don't need to remake the provisionals because this is methyl methacrylate powder liquid. So where I have created a gap, I can just take the existing provisional, hollow grind it, put in some more resin, pop that back on, and then off to the 3D printer, and it comes back and the margins are spot on. There's still retraction cord in there, which is why you can see a bit of the root surface. And then I had to go on and do that on the left side, re-prepare the margins. And this is the detail that's required to make a case. So I trimmed that away, added some more uh, resin material, popped it off, trimmed it up, making sure that there's good embrasure space so the patient can clean in between the teeth and obtain another two impressions of the entire arch of all the prepared teeth. Again, if you can't see the margin clearly, neither can anybody else. This is not a guessing game. You can't guess at these things. And often what I will do is flow some, after the impression's hard, I'll flow some new impression material in and around these teeth so that when it gets poured up, the stone is kept away from the margin so it doesn't get inadvertently damaged when the lab separating dies and trimming these things up. I supplied a model of the temporaries and the lab knows and the lab I've been using for about a dozen years now, if not longer, is Prism Dental out here in Mississauga, and please replicate my vision. Here it is, I've given it to you. And notes, photographs such as, the, such as these are great to send back and forth. So the treatment plan is to make a four unit bridge in this area. I wanna make splinted crowns on the 23, the 24, the 25, and then cantilever off a small little pontic to act as the 26. The 27, I'm going to remove, I just kept it there. Uh, it just provided some landmark and also the ability to index that little acetate sheet when I made the provisional. So it was nice to have a, a distal landmark and said, okay, I want a four unit bridge here. Central lateral going to the bicuspid with a small pontic for the cuspid. Here, I want splinted, two splinted crowns uh, because I don't want you to move after. And she had a bit of a knot bite, which we'll go into. So for security, I want splinted crowns, the central lateral. And then, as I said, this will be one bridge. Typically, I do love porcelain fused to metal. That's the go-to material I've used uh, for most of my career. The, pa the past 15 years, I have done zirconia quite a bit. Uh, four small bridges in the anterior, and we thought if we could break this up, it would be a nice case in zirconia. But I just asked the lab, what do you think of the margins? Will it fly? And they said, yes, it will. I got the framework returned. I always do this. I want to check in this phase, does everything sit passively? Does it go to place without a jiggle, a wiggle, or a rock? And at this point, uh, there were two red lines here and they asked me to please remove a little bit of material from the prepared teeth, about half a millimeter or so. And I didn't, when I, this sometimes happens where maybe I thought they would want it thicker in this area for whatever reasons to try to make it more aesthetically pleasing. But for the life of me, I couldn't understand exactly why because I had measured the interior dimensions of the provisionals and I thought there was sufficient reduction. 
I should have questioned it, questioned it more as it turned out, but I didn't at this phase. So I got the frameworks returned, they were tried in, everything seemed to fit just beautifully. Obtain a wax bite registration. And then I had a pickup impression of how the frameworks sit on the teeth related to each other. And this will develop a soft tissue model. So there's a little bit of impression material, light body in each retainer that's popped off and then it goes back to the lab and they'll make a soft tissue study model. The case was returned finish and I thought it was beautiful. I thought the texture was wonderful. The, the, the gradation of color, it didn't look too uniform. It didn't look fake. I, I was blown away about how good it looked. But then small things started to bother me. I said, well, I've never had this where they've where an embrasure has been closed up that much. And what really bothered me is when I went in to insert the bridge, the final product against the temporaries. And I thought the teeth just don't look how I had carved them in the provisionals. That was a big, that was a big problem. The anatomy just did not please my eye. And it took me a while to figure out what it was. And then I hit on it. So again, what I've always said, details, you have to run after everything. And just when you think you've got it all nailed down, maybe you don't. And somebody thought that it, that it would be a good idea to warp this incisal ledge down to make contact in centric with these lower anterior teeth. Somebody had an idea at the lab it just wasn't my idea. And then I recognized why they wanted some of that incisal ledge dusted away. I talked to the, the lab every day. It's just one of those things, an error. Something was missed, but thankfully I caught it at this phase. And looking at it from this view, you can, you can pick up the difference. This is where I want the edge and this is where they place the edge. Somebody thought they got a better idea than I, than I did. So I took the framework and just uh, secured it with a little bit of light body VPS impression material. Here you can see the difference, how thin that was and how there's so much of a more pro positive profile to the provisionals. So I took a pickup impression so they can see what I see in the mouth and transfer these photographs to them with these little messages, follow-up notes. The color and texture is wonderful. However, I'm not pleased with the anatomy. I think we went too far to the lingual. It's not pleasing to my eye. This has resulted in teeth that appear too long because they are too narrow. Also, the embrasure between teeth is very apparent, not because of a lack of porcelain. It's not that the embrasures are uh, the triangle. There's a lack of porcelain in between. But there was a reduction in the bulk of material at the mesial buccal line angles between these centrals. We need more positive profile everywhere. Otherwise, we cast these dark shadows. So all that information was given to the lab along with this photograph. Please replicate my design and return it in biscuit bake. Don't return it finished. Let me see it just before glazing because I got to make sure it's spot on. So it took some time to start carving the anatomy that had proved successful in the provisional phase recognize, yes, it's a little bit stained. She's been wearing it for some six months now. So making sure that what I've carved will be in the final. There's the provisionals, those are the finals. Spend some time, because I asked them to make it a hair bigger. I spent the time refining it as best as I could, sent the case back and it was returned to me. And it looks beautiful, again, in terms of the color and the texture. So there's the temp, 
there's the final, and it's mirror image. Now I can go back to the mouth with some degree of certainty. So it's replicating the provisionals. So here are the provisionals, there's the final, but even more so, that's what the original dentition looked like. So those centrals are off in space for a reason. And trying to warp those back to meet these was just a non-starter. So now my eyes are happy. And if they're happy, typically the patient is happy as well. There it is from the occlusal. And as I said, happy patient. So with the biggest smile, you couldn't see that disparity in the gingival height, the attached gingiva where it was higher on the left side than on the right side. So before and after. Keys to success the takeaways, if you will. Well, first you need analysis of what you're starting with. And for me, that includes stone models. Because on those, I can develop a vision. And then I have to make that vision a reality and allow the patient to test drive it for form and function. And you require exacting temporaries. And then it's making good on that vision, making sure that you can deliver what you've promised. So dentistry, it's still a craft of the hand combining art and science. And it's the delight I experience in training hands to accomplish exact and delicate tasks. And it's the immense pride derived from craftsmanship. Probably the reason I'm doing these posts, a lot of it is the pride I've taken um, and, and the joy in in making a patient happy. And I still practice with a large amount of enthusiasm because in the final analysis, it, what I'm doing is I'm creating functional art. I'm very thrilled to do that. Thank you.